that has joined today. And uh, yes, here we are. And we are with the third webinar of our Human Behavior in Fires webinar series. And uh, this is Enrico Ronke speaking. I am one of the co-leaders of the group within uh, the International Association for Fire Safety Science together with Erika Kuligowski that you've seen before. And uh, I'm very glad today uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Ann Templeton and Dr. Milada Ghani that are two very brilliant researchers and also two dear friends uh, the work in our field. And the, today we're going to hear about the misuse of controversial terminologies in evacuation research. So a very interesting topic uh, because uh, let's say there is a lot of discussions uh, in the scientific community uh, of human behavior in fire on what is the correct terms that we should use when referring uh, uh, to different aspects linked to evacuation. Uh, just to give a practical example, I'm part of the ISO group on vocabulary uh, of uh, Technical Committee 92 on fire safety, and I hear a lot of discussions there uh, on different terms. So this is probably going to be very useful also for me to feed that conversation. And just uh, a couple of information here. This is the third event of our webinar series. We have um, a YouTube channel where we post all our uh, webinars and uh, uh, you also have the opportunity to join uh, the Human Behavior and Fire Panel Group of IFSS. Uh, this can be to contribute or remain updated. You don't pay anything, it is free. We're gonna post now this link in the chat. You just put your info and uh, you uh, enter the mailing list and uh, you will be uh, kept updated on the next events and next activities uh, of our group. So as mentioned uh, today, uh, we are gonna have first Dr. Anne Templeton. That is a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow in the Department of Psychology at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And uh, she's a specialist in understanding inter and intergroup processes in collective behavior with a particular focus on applying social identity approach to pedestrian simulation. So she's really into social identity theory. So this is a very good perspective uh, for this webinar. Thanks, Anne, to be here. And then we will have also uh, Mila Dagani as a senior lecturer and the Australian Research Council DCRA fellow at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering of the University of New South Wales. Uh, in Sydney, and he specializes in various domains of human factors and public safety research, particularly pedestrian evacuation dynamics. So also uh, uh, really uh, great uh, uh, to have you here, Milad. Thanks to both. So I don't want to take too much of your time because we want to have uh, you both presenting. And then at the end, we also want to have some Q&A sessions. So if there are questions from the audience, we will uh, pick it up uh, there at the end. So I now stop my slides and I ask you, Anne, uh, if you can show your slideshow. Absolutely. All right. Uh, the floor second. is yours. Thank you. Can I just check the slide is changing? Yes, everything works. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you so much for having me present this talk and thank you so much everyone for, uh, for attending and coming along. Um, Enrico just gave you a bit of a, a brief blurb about me, but just to give you a bit more background context. So my background is in crowd psychology, and then I moved into pedestrian modeling for my PhD and then later into evacuation research. And coming from that crowd psychology perspective, I was really surprised to see terms like panic and contagion in the evacuation literature and the broader pedestrian modeling literature, because we don't really use them as explanations for collective behavior in modern crowd psychology. In fact, a lot of our work is trying to refute the notions behind these terms. So in this talk, I really want to look at, I want to look at the evidence for panic and contagion in emergencies. And I just want to dissect what we actually mean by those terms and make some recommendations for ways to explain evacuation behavior, behavior and evacuations. So why do we want to discuss panic and contagion? Why is this important? Oh, whoops, here we go. Um, we use terms like stampede and mass panic and contagion, and we, we often use these to explain collective behavior in emergencies. And the underlying idea of these terms and these sort of sensationalist headlines that you see in the media, like you've got some in the slide here, is that people in a crowd will become panicked automatically and they'll act irrationally and dangerously. That's the kind of sensationalist connotation. 
But we use these terms in literature quite a lot. And I really want to dissect what these terms mean and how inaccurate or accurate they are when understanding collective response to emergencies. So the first recommendation I really want to make, I don't know why this is, is jumping ahead, there we are. The first recommendation I really want to make is to not overuse the term panic. I say this for a few reasons. I want to really think about how common this idea of panic actually is or isn't. This is uh, one of my favourite papers uh, I've read recently. There's a systematic review that was conducted by Dermot Barr and colleagues. And it was a review of 630 media articles about 127 collective flight responses to misperceived threats. And I find the systematic really, in really interesting because the authors actively search for terms such as stampede, flee or panic. And then they looked at the description of the behaviour in the media and also what could be seen in video footage of those events. And when they were looking in detail at behaviour of the events, they found that stampedes were actually very rare, and there were rarely reasons for injuries like we tend to assume in the literature. When we look at the occurrence of competitive behaviour like pushing or trampling, this was also relatively rare, it was actually less than half of the incidents that were reviewed. And I think we often have this kind of assumption there's this homogenous sort of panic or herding response in evacuations. But actually what this review found was there are diverse responses to threats or misperceived threats. For example, we found that some people in the emergencies would run away, they would flee, but many just walked away calmly. And others would stop or film or try and investigate the reason for the situation or even try to intervene with the apparent source of the threat. I think something really crucial that comes across from this paper is that reports of behaviour such as the running, the screaming, the crying occurred more in text accounts of the events than could actually be seen in the videos of those incidences. So there's an imbalance of what is reported and what can actually be seen, what's reported in the text about events and then what can actually be seen in the behaviour of those events. And I think this is why it's useful to really critique the idea of what we mean by panic. So emergencies are, can be scary things and it can be really unclear what to do, especially if you've not had kind of guidance beforehand, evacuation guidance. And if we look at footage of emergencies, we might see lots of people running in the same direction, what we might call a stampede. And often terms like panic is used to mean this irrational behaviour, this loss of reason, this acting on instinct. We use terms like fight or flight, which is this kind of automatic biological response to flee. But the problem is that what behaviour people enact in an emergency, what they're actually doing at the time, might make complete sense to them. But we're looking at it from an outsider perspective, and we look at footage to try and infer why people are acting in a certain way with their own biases and expectations. And it wasn't really until the last few decades where we started sort of systematically asking people experiencing the emergency why they behaved in that way. I think it's important to look at the perspective of people in the emergency because knowing the reasons for this behaviour is important to have an accurate idea of why the behaviour is actually happening. So I've only got about 20 minutes, so I'm going to give you a very, very brief history of crowd psychology. Um, this is a huge topic, so I'm very happy to talk about it in more, more detail if anyone's interested. So I want to go back in time to 1985, and one of the first kind of popular books of crowd psychology was by Gustave Le Bon, the, and it was The Crowd, The Study of the Popular Mind. So Le Bon was writing about French crowds, and he was kind of writing for the elite, and he was talking a lot about sort of... Um, uh, people who were uh, in the revolution and he portrayed the crowd as being very criminal as a spineless mass and his argument was that when people enter a crowd just by the product of being in a crowd situation they would lose their sense of self they would become submerged into the crowd they could be easily hypnotized in forming certain actions by a leader and he argued that in emergencies crowd members would irrationally panic and typically do the wrong thing and he also argued that there's this automatic transference of emotion in a crowd, this idea of contagion. So if one person gets angry or panics, everybody would just by being near them. And although these aren't the exact meanings of the words that we use now, we do still see words like contagion and, contagion and irrational panic used now with some of the same connotations. 
if we fast forward about 100 years, <laughs> if we look at uh, modern crowd psychology, the evidence suggests that Le Bon's accounts of panic and contagion don't hold up. And when you look at accounts given by people who've experienced the evacuations or other emergencies, some do report panic. It's not that they say panic doesn't occur, but we really need to critique what this idea of panic actually means. And a great example of this, one of my favourite pieces of work, is by Chris Cocking and John Drury, the survivors of the Hillsborough Stadium disaster. So this was a large disaster at a football match in England in 1989. And um, disaster started when an entry gate was opened because they thought it would be easing uh, crowd flow but, or easing overcrowding, but actually it led to too many fans entering into the, uh, the fan pens and eventually there was a crush. Fans were trying to climb the fences to get onto the pitch to escape and were been held back by security and police. And it was a huge tragedy in modern British history because 97 people died and there were 766 injuries. Chris Cockey and John Drury looked at the language that was used by survivors to describe what was happening during the event. And what they found is that language used by survivors suggests panic means very different things. So, for example, people would refer to themselves as an individual panicking, but said that it wasn't widespread in the crowd, it was them as an individual, it wasn't everyone panicking. Or they would describe feeling fear but not panic. They refuted the idea of acting irrational, even though they were fearful. And when someone did talk about feeling blind panic, it was under very extreme circumstances. They were walking on dead bodies. Apologies, I know it's very early in the morning to be talking about that. But it was understandable that they were feeling that way. Or they used the term panic when they were struggling to really articulate what they, what they meant, how they felt. And it was always talking about the emotions, not the behavior. Or people sometimes reported panicking because they actually wanted to help others, far from this idea of individualistic panic. And crucially, the panic that many described when they were talking about behaviour were normative or understandable behaviours. Or they talked about panicked individuals, but again, not for the whole crowd, or they were describing distress, understandable distress. And some actually discussed there being calm behaviour despite this horrific situation. And I want to look at a few more examples of what survivors of emergencies have said about behaviour that occurred in the, those emergencies to see what panic existed or didn't exist, because we see a similar story. So I mentioned a few key texts here. There's some of my favourite kind of seminal texts for this area. And these papers explored why behaviour happened from the perspective of, of those who experienced the emergency. And they found similar findings for the research across emergencies on cruise ships, Football stadium crushes, stadium fires, hotel fires, bomb scares, building evacuations, train evacuations, lots of different type of emergencies. And what they found is that contrary to panicking, people actually often maintained ordinary behavior, such as queuing, letting others go first to evacuate, saying, you know, you go first. And they reported a sense of calm despite the situation. And when behaviours occurred that we might see from the outside as potentially irrational, such as people returning to dangerous situations to help others, they explained that they were helping others on the basis of feeling part of the same group as them. So what was happening is that in the emergency, this uh, perceived shared fate, this common fate, this facing the same threat, brought them together to feel part of the same group and they helped others on the basis of that group membership. Now, I'm going to talk more about those group dynamics in a minute, but just for now, I want to focus on panic in these quotes. So here's an example from one of the papers. In this first quote, the interviewer asks, did you think anybody panicked? And the person responded, in our carriage, in our train carriage, no. Or if they did, they panicked inwardly. They didn't express their panic. I mean, there was no screaming in our carriage. I mean, people were trying to get out the door, but they weren't trying to get out of the door stupidly. So really refuting this idea of irrational panic, with people running around screaming, they weren't. And I'm not going to read the second quote for the sake of time, but what you can see in this quote is the sense of calm and speaking against the idea of irrational panicking. So it's calm despite the hectic situation and really refuting the idea that people were, they said they weren't, you know, running around to screaming their heads off. Now, if anyone has seen a talk by crowd psychologists, they might have heard of social identity theory and self-categorization theory. These are theories that we often use to explain group dynamics. And I just want to give you a very brief description of them to help kind of underlay a lot of these group dynamics that I'm gonna be talking about. The first is social identity theory. Social identity theory suggests that we have a personal identity, that's our individual differences, idiosyncratic things to us. 
And we have social identities, and these are our memberships of social groups. And we can be members of multiple social groups. It could be a fan of a particular sports team, it could be being an academic, being a Twitch streamer, it can be a firefighter. And knowing, having these social groups is really important for understanding how we navigate the social world, because these groups often have um, kind of norms and behaviours associated with them. They guide us how to act. We look to others in a group to know how we should be acting. And just to give you um, a little, uh, some key terminology for going forward, one key term we use in, in cross psychology is in-group member. This is someone who we perceive as being in the same group as us, the same social category. And this is particularly relevant for emergencies because research uh, from social psychology quite broadly has suggested that if we see someone as an in-group member, we're more likely to help them, to show helping behaviour towards them and trust them, trust information from them. I'll giving you an example there, uh, Levine Tolls, an excellent paper. So self-categorisation theory aims to explain how we categorise others in, and ourselves into these social groups in different contexts. How we shift from considering ourselves as being an individual, that personal identity, to considering ourselves as a group member, that social identity. And this is really important for understanding emergencies, because evidence suggests that perceiving this common fate, this common threat, can bring people together, but they start to see others as group members. And understanding how people come together in an emergency and the effects of that group membership is important for two key reasons. The first is understanding helping and cooperative behaviour, like those I mentioned a minute ago, letting others go first, running back to help others. The second, which I'm going to talk about more now, is understanding social influence, such as how particular behaviours or actions might spread through a crowd in an emergency, and also the bounds of that influence, how far that behaviour might spread or not spread. So my second recommendation is that we should stop using the word contagion and instead use social influence because it is a more nuanced, appropriate description of behaviour. So contagion is this idea that emotions or ideas are contagious and sweep through the crowd with a sort of automatic transference to some degree. Social influence is different. So I want to argue that contagion is not the best explanation for how emotions or behaviour become common in a crowd. A better explanation is social influence. Research from social psychology suggests that we're more likely to look to people in our group for information about how to act. We're more likely to trust them and perceive that what they're doing is normative for our group, it's what group members do. And this can be particularly the case in emergencies because often they're novel, it's not really clear how to react or how, how to respond to this new situation. So we look to others for guidance. I'm conducting research for the UK Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, um, aiming to look at how group dynamics impact evacuations in high-rise buildings, particularly in fire situations. The overall project is led by Michael Spearpoints, it's in collaboration with Steve Gwynn. And this work is a bit of work in progress, it's still fin finalising the analysis, but I just wanted to show you some of the initial findings because I think they're very relevant to explaining social influence. So we conducted individual interviews with 23 members of the Fire and Rescue Services in England and Scotland uh, to explore their understanding of key factors impacting safe evacuations in high-rise residential buildings. We also conducted focus group with uh, focus group interviews with 40 occupants of high rise buildings. Really, they were trying to just dig into the role of group processes and how they would respond or have responded previously to emergency evacuations. So what was really interesting is that social influence came up again and again when understanding behaviour and evacuations. So both the fire and rescue services and the occupants of the high rise buildings said that rather than panicking and rushing out the door, residents tended to delay evacuation or would delay evacuation in order to seek out information from others about and share information with others about how to respond. And residents said that they would even go further into the building, you know, closer to the fire, to seek out others because they wanted to see how they were reacting and get their perspective on what to do, seek validation on how to behave. This information sharing included establishing whether the threat was actually present, how severe it was, what others were doing or saying, and what the best way to respond was. But crucially, one of the most interesting things that we found was there is a hierarchy in whose information was trusted, it's a sort of a hierarchy. 
This was impacted by group processes. So there are lots of examples of information sharing, for example, resident WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups. Um, but the extent to which occupants would follow the evacuation instructions that were given, or the guidance that others were given, very much depended on whether the people or person giving that information was seen to be a member of the same group. So, for example, residents said that they would be more likely to listen to the fire and rescue services if they thought that the fire and rescue services were helping them and acting on behalf of residents. And if they previously had good interactions with fire and rescue services, such as through community engagement initiatives, they made them feel closer to them. In comparison to this, um, some residents actually said that they would be less likely to listen to instructions from, say, the police or even open the front door in case it was the police because they felt that the police were our group. They were different. They weren't acting on behalf of the residents. They weren't in the same group, the same situation. Another example, if we just look at the kind of intra-group relations within residents, is that they said they would seek out their friends in the building first when establishing how to act and that they trusted the friends more than a resident WhatsApp group with people who they didn't feel as close to. So in a nutshell, what we're finding in this analysis is that the evidence we found about responses to fires and high-rise buildings in the UK seemed to not support any theories about panic or contagion. Instead, residents delay evacuation to seek out information about the fire and decide how to act. And when deciding how to act, this is the important bit, they trusted and followed information more from people they saw as being in-group members or acting on behalf of the group. So there are limitations to the social influence and limitation to who is attended to and who is followed. Just briefly, this is the last bit of work I'm gonna tell you about. So we've done, I've talked quite a lot about qualitative work. I wanna show you some experiment, experimental evidence we have for this. This is also some work in progress at the moment. So it's part of a project called Perceived Threats and Stampedes, a relational model of collective fear responses. And really in this, we want to understand the role of group processes in response to threats in an evacuation scenario. It's led by Professor John Drury at the University of Sussex, and it's funded by the ASRC. Um, Enrico is also part of this project. The core question here is who do we pay attention to in the immediate aftermath of an emergency and how does this impact our evacuation behaviour? So we actually have a series of studies that build on each other, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to give you an example study and some example findings. So here's our design. We recruited people who considered themselves to be very concerned about environmental issues, and we told them it was for an urban navigation study. It wasn't, that's deception, never trust a psychologist. They were actually given an evacuation scenario. So they're presented with this virtual environment where an ambiguous sound goes off, they could potentially be seen as threatening. They're then told by members of the crowd, a mem members of the crowd that it was either, that sound was either a gunshot, so something threatening, a door slamming, something non-threatening, or a control condition where it was unknown, they didn't know what it was. And crucially, the information about what the noise was, was given by either an in-group member someone who is also an environmentalist or a stranger. This is the control condition. And so we manipulated whether the noise was threatening or not and whether the, who the information was coming from, in-group member or someone else. And we measured the effects of this on identification with others in the crowd, the extent to which they felt part of the same group with others, the intended response for the evacuation, trust and in information about the noise and perceived danger. So the preliminary findings suggest that when the noise was perceived to be threatening, this is the gunshot condition, it increased the perception that others in the crowd were part of the same group. It brought them together. And this is very similar from what, what I've mentioned earlier. We've seen other sort of emergencies where that perceived common threat, that perceived threat brings people together to feel part of the same group. And the influence of others, how much they would follow others, was related to the extent to which they saw those others as being in-group members. So they would be more likely to follow the behavior of others the more they saw them as in-group, as being part of that same group. So what does all of this mean? Just to bring it all together. Please, 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 let's not rely on the word panic. I think we can do better with describing that behavior. 
Panic is a really easy catch-all word, especially when looking at flight behavior. But we should be specific and consider what's actually happening from the perspective of people in the crowds and think about what we mean when we're saying panic. Do we actually mean that people are alarmed, that they are uncertain or scared? And keep in mind that the evidence suggests people will still act rationally and look for appropriate courses of action, even when they are alarmed or scared. And the evidence suggests that people do not usually act irrationally in emergencies but they're reacting to novel, uncertain situations and potentially scary events. Actually, the evidence suggests people often underreact or will, depending on the emergency, they might actually delay leaving while they look to others for information. And the role of group dynamics in understanding collective responses comes up again and again across all different types of emergencies. I think going forward, we really need to explore these in more detail and evaluate how and why crowd members interact and respond to threatening situations. For example, we can see from research and group dynamics, there's very little evidence for contagion, this idea that emotions spread wildly and herding behavior occurs. Instead, we see how people may delay evacuation while they seek information from others. This operates within those boundaries of who is trusted. If people are more likely to trust those they see as being a member of the group or acting on behalf of the group. The evidence suggests in a nutshell, social influence is a better way for understanding how collective behaviour emerges and the bounds of how much that behaviour spreads. So thank you very much for listening. Um, this is really a whistle-stop tour. If you have any questions or want to talk about it, I'd love to. Here's my email address. In the meantime, I will stop sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Anne, for the very interesting and, let's say, spot-on presentation on terminology. And now it's time for Milad, so we will take all questions uh, at, the, at the end. So, Milad, please share your screen, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Enrico, and thank you very much, Anne, for the beautiful presentation. She absolutely covered a lot of very useful grounds in this, in this space. It's very useful for myself as well. It is a pleasure to be with you all. Um, I am a little bit conscious of time, so I'm going to quickly get into the main content with not um, too much introduction. So let's get into the main part. Okay, I have to put some disclaimers first. So uh, the topic is about the use of term controversial term terminologies. And as you will see in my talk, the talk is itself is a little bit controversial as well. My request is that uh, you don't take any of the content that I'm presenting against me in the future. The topic is complicated, and in order for me to be able to get to the bottom of it and dissect the problem, I have to have a candid conversation with you. And that requires me getting into a little bit of nitty gritty level of details. And if anybody's work it gets mentioned, and if anybody's name as an author or academic gets mentioned, please don't hold it against me. It is just purely for the purpose of um, uh, making a making an academic uh, discussion. And please don't assume that um, neither Anne or I are policing the literature or uh, acting as vigilantes. And if you get challenged on, on your papers, for example, on the use of these terminologies, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is us. That sentiment is shared with, uh, you know, across a lot of people. And we are just pre presenting that sentiment to you today. We just happen to be the, the ones presenting it. So please don't think that uh, Hagani is a literature police, and if you get challenged for the use of these terminologies, it's necessarily me. Okay, let's move on to the main topic. The main sources of the uh, presentation talk is these two papers. The first paper that um, we wrote in 2019 with Emiliano Cristiani, Nicolai Bode, Mike Bode, and Alessandro Corbetta, uh, titled Panic Irrationality and Herding, and a paper, and a more recent paper in that I published in 2021 in Physica of the knowledge domain of crowd dynamics. So predominantly the content is coming from these two studies. So what I am covering, I'm mainly covering these, these issues. What are the controversial terms and why do we care about them? How old is this, this, this discussion? How prevalent is the problem? What's the origin of the problem? Who are the people who are using these um, languages? I'm using a little bit of a spicy language here. I hope you don't take it literally. Um, uh, and I am also going to have a brief look at the language of non-academic media uh, in relation to the use of these terms. Also, at the end, I'm going to summarize what the implications of the use of panic and irrationality is and what my recommendations is and what my recommendations are. 
and what, also what are the implications of the use of the term herding and what are the recommendations in that regard. So this is the scope of the talk for today. Um, I was trying to come up with an introduction. I could not come up with one better than the one that uh, we wrote on the uh, on the paper, Panic Irrationality and Herding. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to read it out to you. Here we go. As researchers working in the field of pedestrian dynamics, we have experienced that the presentation of a piece of research on the topic of crowd evacuation, whether to an academic audience or lay audience, barely goes without uh, barely goes by without researchers being confronted with these questions. How about the effect of panic? How do you model experiment panic? And to a lesser extent, we get these questions from in, in our review processes, although not recently, unless we go to non-specialty journals. Another point, we have also observed that these debates are often not resolved with a rigorous argument based on facts and empirical evidence, and are rather addressed with some level of speculation and resorting to intuition. Nevertheless, nevertheless, researchers often concede that these might be limitations of their study. Moving on, the question that arises is why, after so many years of research in the field of crowd dynamics, these terms have remained so interactable? And my last point, the issue of panic, I have observed this in the literature, the issue of panic constitutes a rather frequent disclaimer at the discussion section of publications and crowd evacuation papers, and a common ground for criticizing the modeling and experimentation in this field. Such disclaimers often appear in wordings such as, these experiments were conducted under non-panic conditions, or the influence of panic has been excluded from the experiment. So the fact that researchers have felt oblig obligation to put these disclaimers. So this gives the indication that simulating or modeling panic is going to be a future development or a gold standard or an ultimate goal in this field, something that the research is headed towards, but one that we have not been able to tackle just yet. Okay, so what are the implications of all of these? Okay, we get to the bottom of it in this talk. The controversial terms, what are they and why do we care about their use? The terms are panic, irrationality, hurting, and stampede predominantly. The reason we care about them is not just because they are inaccurate terminologies, it's because of the fact that they have significantly altered the course of crowd dynamics research, and we think that they have misdirected a lot of research efforts in this space. That's why we are talking about the terminologies. That's not simply because the terminologies are not necessarily accurate. They have major implications on research and in crowd management practices. How old is discussion? is this discussion? Well, you might not believe it, but the discussion dates back to many, many years ago, much older than I thought. So in the paper, The Knowledge Domain of Crowd Dynamics, I have presented an over, a historical overview of the field, uh, pedestrian dynamics. And I came across this seminar in human behavior, I can't see the title, in emergencies. And um, in, that, in that webinar, which was held in 1978, essentially, there was a meeting dedicated to the notion of panic, where in the meeting, prior to the meeting, all panelists were asked to address themselves in some way to three questions. Do you see the concept of panic as a useful one for the study purposes? This is exactly what we are, we have, the, the point that we have, we have been trying to investigate in the paper, Panic Irrationality Herding. Back then, I was not aware of this meeting and these uh, conference papers that had emerged 10 years before I was born. And it is very interesting to note that those discussions are not really original put forward by us, but rather they have been talking about this issue in, back in 1970s. How do you conceptualize what are the factors responsible for the phenomena? And what are both research consequences and practical implications of thinking about panic in the way that you do? And if you look at the sentiment of these papers, they actually share the same sentiment that we are presenting to, today to you. And it is very interesting that since then the literature has taken a turn and has gone against it. So what has been the fact, the, uh, the motivating factor for that, we get uh, to that as well. In terms of the implications of the, the use of these terms in policy, their implications are crystal clear. It has been used as an excuse for politicians, crowd managers, emergency services to withhold information from people. You, you might remember that. Uh, back when Trump was in, was in office, um, he mentioned in an interview with Bob Woodward that the reason that he withheld information about coronavirus from people and its severity was that he didn't want people to, to, to panic. And that's, that, that, 
um, way of thinking is actually shared among many people. It's that this way of thinking is kind of entrenched in the in the mind of uh, public. And when they become politicians, also they, they take this, that to uh, emergency um, management practices. So that's the implications of the use of these terms in, in actual um, uh, emergency management practice by politicians, by emergency services. But our focus today is within academic literature not necessarily practice. So in the paper, Panic Irrationality and Herding, what we looked at was, first of all, we investigated whether the use of the controversial terms are increasing in the literature or they are gradually disappearing from the literature. And what we observed was that for, for all three terms, Panic Irrationality and Herding, the use of the terms are actually increasing. They're not going anywhere. But not everybody saying, uses this language in the same way. Some people use them as they mean it. Some people, use, like myself, in many of the papers, we use them uh, as we criticize it. So there's a mixture of the um, mention of these terms. The blue ones are the ones where the person is in support of the theory. The red ones are the, uh, um, the frequency of the ones where the person uses them in, uh, in a critical way. But nevertheless, the use of the terms in the, in the literature of dynamics seems to be uh, increasing. And I have more recently looked at the entire uh, papers of crowd dynamics, nearly 7,000 papers, and I identified those that have used at least one of these controversial terminologies in their title and abstracts. The subset is about 700, 670 or something. And as you see, the frequency of the use of the terms has been increasing over the years, panic being the most dominant one, one but in, to a lesser extent, the other three terms as well. There, is, there seems to be a sign of uh, decline in the use of these terms, especially since 2019. I don't want to flatter myself too much and say that it's because of the paper panic irrationality and hurting. It might be a contributing factor, but another contributing factors, factor could be the fact that the number of crowd papers have slightly declined during pandemic. I have covered that in another, in another paper. Some of you might be reviewing that paper at the moment. Um, um, it's, um, it's a paper on the review at this stage. But um, um, overall, it seems that since 2019, the frequency has uh, slowed down to, to, to a certain extent. We cannot be too sure what the reason is, but I, I would like to hope that the uh, 6,000 downloads that the paper Panic Irrationality and Herding has had has had some effect on the use of these terms, hopefully. And to, the very, to, to, to this very date, the very recent papers that are emerging in crowd dynamics, even in the context of pandemic, you can see that the, the controversial language is being used. For example, this quote from this paper that I'm not specifying says, numerical simulations with this model reveal that these measures do not prevent the transmission of disease in high density areas, especially when agents move under panic. So the language still sticks to the literature and it's very persistent despite our efforts in um, and criticizing it. I've also looked at the um, frequency of the use of the terms in relation to other ter terms in the abstract of those 700 uh, papers that have mentioned these terms. And it appears that panic and its variations, it's got a lot of variation and I have combined them all to the term panic. Panic and its variations has a central role, meaning that it gets co-mentioned with almost every term in crowd dynamics. Whereas in the literature, the use of a stampede is more specific and it gets mentioned with a more specific set of commission with a more specific set of terms. And the herd behavior also gets mentioned with, a, with an even more specific set of terms. So panic is the central one in the academic literature in terms of the frequency and in terms of diversity of topics that it has um, you know, penetrated. In. But what's the origin of the problem? Well, the origin of the problem, um, the frequency of the use of these terms, I can pinpoint to the paper of Helbing in 2000 in Nature, which is probably the, one of the most, or the, the most influential paper of crowd dynamics, where he presented the social force model in the context of panic. He used the term panic 37 times, and he used the term herding 10 times in the paper. Well, it's a very influential paper. Once, once you have a paper in Nature, people would follow that pathway of thinking that this is the way forward in the future. And I think this is where our love for using this language started in the literature. Helbing himself in the paper attributes herding as one of the characteristics of panic behavior. Here he says, 
Uh, one of the characteristics of panic behavior is that people show a tendency towards mass behavior that is to do what other people do, which we know as herd behavior. And this is also where our love for um, um, discovering counterintuitive phenomena in crowd dynamics started to emerge. For example, the fact that we have to take a space away from people in order for their movement to become more efficient. If we put an obstacle in front of them, or if we limit space for them, their movement becomes more efficient. This is based on the mentality that people show irrational behavior during evacuations, during uh, life-threatening situations. And if you give them more options, they do things that are to their detriment, whereas none of this has been supported by any empirical evidence, but that has set a precedent in the literature that we really like to see counterintuitive crowd control measures. Put an obstacle, put a block in front of people, take space away from them, ask them not to rush at the exits when there is a life-threatening situation, ask them to slow down because if they rush, it's going to slow down, slow down the process. Well, I can speak about the you know, all aspects of Helping's paper for like an hour. I was going to present it in the PET conference in 2020 before it got canceled due to coronavirus. Uh, then after it got, because it was the 20th anniversary of the paper. Then after it got canceled, I decided uh, not to do it and also didn't participate in PET. So hopefully in next PET, there will be an opportunity if, if um, you know, Alessandro and Mohsen give me, a, give me an opportunity for an extended talk, I will uh, cover all aspects of the paper. But as far as the language goes, I think this has been the reason for the use of controversial terms in crowd dynamics. And on top of that, oh, by the way, this phenomenon, in the first paragraph of the paper, um, Helping mentions one of the most disastrous forms of collective behavior is the kind of crowd stampede induced by panic. And he goes on and cites two references. And when you look at reference number one, it's actually the paper from Keating, which is titled The Myth of Panic. Well, I cannot help but notice the irony of the situation that this, this paper, as, this, as, as uh, the title shows, cannot be any support of this, this statement. The paper is called The Myth of Panic in the first place. So that is uh, a little bit um, you know, contradictory to me and, and, and confusing the way uh, these references have been put forward. Also, the news and views piece that was written uh, in the same issue of uh, nature on top of this paper uh, to you know, elaborate a bit on, on the contribution of the paper didn't leave any room for a speculation that the point panic, the issue of panic, was the selling point of the paper. After all, Helbing had already presented in a paper in 1995 in physical review with the principles of social force. So and that, and along the fact that this, this news and views is focused on the issue of panic, did not leave any room for doubt that the matter panic was in fact the selling point and was considered the contribution of the paper by the editors and reviewers of Nature, right? And this, has, this news and views piece has also had many implications for research in this area. I will go through a few of them. For example, this paragraph reads, to decide whether a particular model is an accurate description of real life or to determine which model is the best for the situation under consideration requires real data to compare, to compare with each model's predictions. Beautiful, that's what we say too. But what, is, what comes next is, but such data are scarce and or non-existent and may be extremely difficult to collect. This became a talking point for many papers that came after this. So they decided, okay, we, have, we are facing a situation, panic, it's not solvable, it's in, so intractable, there's not no data. So we have only two feasible solutions. One uh, is that either we resort to our, or to our own intuitions for our modeling purposes, to our, for our modeling practices, or we do animal experiments. We do experiments with ants, we do experiments with groups of mice instead of doing experiments with humans, simply because of the fact that panic cannot be experimented with humans. So that gave a justification for many of the subsequent papers to go down paths that we do not really see beneficial to crowd dynamics. Modeling with, without any connection to empirical data or doing experiments that have no connection to human participants. That's that. And also another element is this picture that entrenched the idea in the mind of the uh, next generations of crowd researchers and PhD students, et cetera, et cetera that if you develop a model that does not create this situation, that's not an accurate model. Why? Because 
a graphist in nature uh, came up with this um, with this image. Well, this this does not have any connection to any to any empirical evidence. It's just a, a nicely nice looking graphics, but it had many implications for research in this area. And I'm pretty sure that you have seen this image or something equivalent of it in many other other papers. So cannot emphasize on the role of these two papers on the um, on the future of on the development of crowd dynamics since 2000. And also, last one is that there is this line saying that the consequences of crushing, trampling, and panic in, panic in crowds are well known. And similar to the original, to the actual uh, paper by Helby, uh, the, the author cites two references. And one of them is this pa paper by Johnson. And uh, this paper by Johnson is the, is, is the paper that reads in the abstract. I report evidence showing that panic did not cause the death and injury of numerous young people prior to concert, blah, blah. So I cannot see how this reference can be supportive of the statement mentioned in the paper. So that is just to me inaccurate referencing. Okay, enough criticizing other people's work. No, no, no not enough yet. I have more, one more slide, sorry. So if there is any doubt still that the um, paper uh, of helping in nature had an effect on the use of these terminologies. I'll give you some statistics as well. So if you look at all papers of crowd dynamics, uh, Helbing's paper gets cited in almost a quarter of them. In almost one quarter of the all papers of crowd dynamics, you see a reference to Hel pa uh, Helbing's paper in nature in 2000. But when you look at the subset of papers that do mention uh, controversial terms in their titles or abstracts or keywords. The, in almost 40% of them, um, Helbing's paper is cited. So there's a correlation between citing Helbing's paper and the use of controversial terminologies in crowd dynamics research. So I rest my case about that thing. So uh, that has that has had an effect in and um, in the use of these terminologies and probably the most prominent effect in this area. But let's gossip a little bit. Who is using these terms? Who are the authors in crowd dynamics that are using these terms? Yours truly is also included in the in the in this in this map. That's right. So many people are using it. It's more people than we think, but more some people are more frequently using these terms. Some people, some of our dear colleagues from China who are contributing to this domain, they do use this language. Uh, some of the colleagues that I have uh, co-authored it, such as Majid Sarvi, they use this language. For example, near Dr. Shiva Koti um, uh, did, a, did his PhD on the topic of panic. So in all of his publications, essentially, which he used, in which he used um, ant experiments, he did drop the word panic because the focus of the work was, back then it was trendy, but back then these discussions probably had not taken effect as much as uh, they, they have now. And he used a lot of that language in his publications and that reflected in, for example, his co-authors um, um, publications, Magic Survey. Um, I have used the term in, in various papers, such as Panic Irrationality and Hurting, or some of the papers that I, that I have in the context of social influence. I had to put the term Hurting in the title so that the paper gets noticed, but I usually put it in quotation mark, or I refer to it as so-called herd behavior, or I, uh, say the, the hair type behavior. So I try to moderate it a little bit, but I know that if I don't use the term, then somebody else working on the topic of social influence might not notice my paper just because I don't use the language that they want me to use. So that, that there is this, you know, this conflict that we are facing when we, we're presenting our paper. Do, do, you, do we want to use our um, you know, punchline language to get the attention of other people, or do we want to get to stick to our principles? So I try to do something in between. A little bit more gossip for you. Um, also to show that to show how big a hypocrite I am. Um, I when I was doing developing this crowd modeling software, um, uh, I'm not sure if you probably know me as a person working in empirical domain, but I'm not sure if you noticed that I developed the pedestrian simulation model at the time that I was doing those experiments. And as I was developing this model uh, in collaboration with Magic Sarvi, uh, he really wanted the uh, software to be called Crowd Panics Modeler. And obviously I didn't care enough to challenge that name. I, I thought as long as the features of the model are uh, consistent with, uh, with my preferences, I would be happy. So I did not care about the terminology that we were using. So if you go to this paper, if you go to the supplementary material of this paper, you will see this video visualization. And in the corner, you will see the name crowd panic modeler. Well, 
the name of that this software has changed uh, numerous times since then. But back then, obviously, I didn't, I didn't care enough to, to argue against using uh, the term. So how is that for some people? I can see. And also, the names that I showed you is not the only people who are using the language. Those, those were the main stream of people uh, in crowd dynamics that are using this language. There are a whole lot of people uh, that have dropped these terms in at least two publications and in their title, title and abstract, not just in the body of the paper. And at least 20, 275 uh, authors have mentioned these terms in at least two publications. So I got a little bit suspicious of that. I thought it, it cannot be this many. I, and I started you know, verifying these um, um, notes of authors. And I actually was able to identify the papers where they used the term panic. So it is real, at least 270 five people have used this language. But you should also bear in mind that not everybody uses this language with the same sentiment. Some people, some influential authors in this space, such as John Drury or, uh, or his co-authors, and they have used this language because they criticize the notion behind the theory of panic. So they, they have no choice but to use the language. So um, it's a mixture. Some people who use the language use this in support of the theory. Some people are using it um, um, more critically, including myself, I, I would like to think. And when you look at the country of origin of these publications, well, obviously, um, of publications coming from uh, China um, are more representative. But also, you should um, bear in mind that um, Chinese academics are contributing the most to the field of crowd dynamics. So it is expected that their uh, representation in the subset of papers that use um, uh, controversial language is a bit um, more noticeable. Once you normalize this number uh, based on the uh, number of papers that each country contributes to the field, the proportion of the papers that, and you consider the proportion of the papers coming from each country that use the controversial language, actually Australia stands out. So, and you know why now, based on the uh, content that I presented earlier, you know why Australia is, uh, actually the most contributing to the use of uh, controversial language proportion wise based on the number of papers and uh, proportional to the number of papers that are emerging. And this is a little bit uh, about an upcoming work that we're doing with uh, Claudio. Uh, he's leading this, uh, this effort and I, am, uh, I have the pleasure of being part of it. And he is looking at the uh, media reporting. He has probably covered this in a in his, his keynote speech in PET, I'm not sure. Um, we are looking at the media coverage of all the reports on crowd accidents since 1902. We are talking about some uh, 300 uh, reports of media or 300 accidents. And um, this is based on the first 100, 100 accidents in which we look at the accidents before 2000, from nine, nine, 1902 to 2000. And when you look at the frequency of the mention of the terms, it's actually the opposite to uh, academic language. In academic language, panic is the dominant term. But when you look at the language of the media, this stampede is the language uh, that is predominant. So we are curious to know if we look at the more contemporary versions of the media, if we see the same effect or if we see a, a, a different pattern. We haven't done that yet. This is work in progress, but I just wanted to give you a uh, heads up and some brief um, you know, overview of the work that we are doing in this space, uh, led by uh, Claudio Feliciani. Okay, we are getting to the end points. So what have been the implications of the use of panic? One implication has been that it is justified uh, people using of non-human entities for their, uh, for their evacuation experiments, something that I really do not condone and I don't recommend. So since 2018, you might have noticed that the use of these um, sorry, the use of these um, animal experiments have dropped. And honestly, since 2019, I have not seen a single experiment in uh, using an, mice or ants uh, for their evacuation experiments. So um, fortunately, the, language, the, the conversations that have, that have been going on uh, has had some effect in this space. Another issue about irrationality is that it completely ignores the fact that in a fight and flight situation, uh, we have observed when you increase the stress level, when you increase the urgency level in the, in the in experimental context, in, in simulated, simulated evacuation scenarios, people actually show behavior that is more efficient compared to low urgency levels. So when you increase the level of urgency, the optimality of people's actions 
become even better, become more, they, they show decisions that are more optimal. So the notion that as people get into a life-threatening situations, they show irrational behavior, might not necessarily be supported by empirical evidence. I, actually, I have observed a lot of evidence to the contrary of it in the uh, simulated evacuation experiments that I have con conducted and analyzed. Um, these are the issues with panic. So we do not like to use panic. We instead recommend that the panic be uh, substituted by more measurable and operationalizable language, such as the, the effect of stress or urgency level on people's behavior. And similar to that, for rationality or irrationality, we recommend that this does not contribute to the field and it is best if it, if it is substituted by the notion of optimality. When you use rationality, rationality has a very specific uh, definition in, for example, in the literature of economics. And uh, when you use it, people get confused that are you using it in relation to the definition of economics so un until, unless uh, you come up with a clear definition for rationality, I think the use of it is going to be detrimental to your research. And I think that if you use the, the, the term optimality, it will be more understandable for, for, for an academic audience in this particular field. And bear in mind that when we talk about the notion of optimality, optimality can be analyzed at the individual level or at the system level. And regardless of that, you need to establish a benchmark reference in order to measure optimality against. But that's besides the point. I think the mere so, um, use of opti optimality as a, as a terminology would guide our research efforts in a better direction because the term is neutral. The term allows for people's actions to be optimal or suboptimal, whereas irrationality implies the fact that people's actions are already suboptimal. Similar thing with herding. Herding is also a preloaded language predisposed with the notion that people tend to imitate in all of their actions during an emergency scenario. But in the paper, Panic, Irrationality, and Herding, we have put together all the empirical evidence related to social influence. And the evidence points out to the fact that not in every scenario people tend to imitate. It, there is much nuance involved. It depends on what, what type of behavior you're looking at. It depends on the context. In some contexts and in, some, in relation to some aspects of behavior, people do not tend to imitate. Rather, they, they tend to do the opposite behavior. They tend to avoid the action of majority. But when you use the term herding, it does not leave any space for non-imitative behavior. It is already mentioned, it is already loaded with the, uh, with the connotation of herding, with, with the connotation of imita imitation or imitative behavior. And also when you use the term herding, uh, it kind of ignores all other contributing factors to people's decision-making. Research has shown that people's decision-making is not based on a single factor. People use a whole range of factors in their decision-making, in their evacuation decision-making. And social influence is just one of those. Whereas when you use the term herding, it gives the impression that people's decision-making is purely based on the uh, action of others and does not leave with the, uh, any room for the role of any contributing factor. So as Anne mentioned beautifully in her presentation, I think that this term should be substituted by terms such as social influence, peer behavior, or peer influence, or things to that effect. We are not policing, we are not making rules, these are just recommendations. And yes, I just sum up on the term herding. Um, make sure that you differentiate between various aspects of people's uh, behavior when it comes to peer influence. Peer influence in the action to initiate evacuation could be different compared to peer influence in exit choice, compared to peer influence in exit choice changing behavior. So the, the role of peer behavior should be studied in relation to each aspect of behavior separately. And also don't forget the role of contextual moderating factors, density level, the level of urgency in the environment, the familiarity of the person with the space, the size of the venue. They all tend to modulate the role of um, um, peer behavior, and also don't forget the role of individual differences. Not everybody acts the same. Some people tend to imitate, some people tend to not imitate, and the role of individual differences should be considered in this space as well. Well, that wraps up my, my, my talk, and I really appreciate you uh, listening, and uh, really looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Milad. Thanks uh, for the very nice presentation and interesting content. Uh, so uh, we are uh, very short with time. So first I do my homework and I just repeat that if you want to keep uh, um, yourself updated on these type of events, sign up uh, at the link that I put be, uh, here in the chat uh, where you will get information about the uh, next webinars and activities of the UMB Evergreen Fires IFSS permanent group. We have we are over time, but if it's okay with the speakers, we can have just a couple of questions very quickly. And I mean, if people have to jump off for the next meeting, I hope uh, uh, it's not a problem. Uh, I just picked some of the questions because there were a lot of comments in the chat, which is nice uh, that this sparked a lot of interest. There was one question from Mike Kinsey that he mentioned, could this be magnified by the fact that we have non-native English speakers? So can this be linked to the fact that uh, non-native English speakers do not appreciate their honest use of the war panic. Anne or Milad, do you have some comments on this? Oh, would you like me to go? Uh, I Maybe. think both. You can go, go for it, Milad. You go first. Sure thing. Thank you. Well, absolutely. And also social media. Well, we have our own platform, Twitter. We are connected on Twitter. And we all, um, as a result of that, we can, we can share all these ideas. And you should bear in mind that um, authors from some other countries, they are not necessarily on these social media platforms typically, and they do not use yeah, absolutely English language as a first language as well. So the combination I think is a factor. I think um, social media is a bigger factor. For example, how many of our top authors of Inkarat Dynamics um, are present on Twitter? How many of them are involved in these conversations? And how many of them, when we put these things on Twitter, when we share these uh, sentiments on Twitter in our tweets, um, how many of them get exposed to it? Probably not many. I think that's a, that's a factor that um, makes our message not get across uh, to you know, certain, certain areas of the world. And do you want to comment as well? Yeah, I, I would echo that. I do, I do think that panic is, I called it a catch-all term. And I call it a catch-all term because we tend to say panic when we see any kind of fleeing behavior or anything that we think um, looks like people acting at crowd flight in a kind of extreme way. So it's very easy to just say, oh, that's panic. And I think that's why it's so important that we actually dissect. Well, what do we mean by panic? It's actually that people are alarmed, that they're uncertain, are they fearful? But panic has, the problem with using panic as that catch-all term is that it has these connotations of irrational individualistic panic. And actually the evidence doesn't hold up that that's what happens most of the time. And also, as Malad touched on in his presentation as well, when we talk about panic as an explanation for behavior, it's often used to say, this is why there was an accident. And the evidence doesn't hold up for that either. There is very little evidence that irrational panic occurs or that it is what is responsible for crowd crushes, for example, looking at that systematic review I mentioned. So I guess in a nutshell, yeah, I think it's easy to say this is because of panic, because panic can explain so many different types of behaviours. But if we're changing the language, we want to be more specific, which we should be if we really want to understand why and um, how people are feeling, why behaviour is happening, we need to come up with better and more nuanced terms for explaining it. And I just have one last follow-up question. We have a lot of interesting comments uh, in the chat and also good references. I saw, uh, I think, uh, a, a few, let's say, very known uh, papers and references about the, the use of the word panic and so on. But there is one general question that we have uh, from uh, Reno from Mass University. How can we stop median people using the P word? So how can we get this not to happen so what are the actions that we should do concretely because i mean milad you talk about social media and so on but what else could we do as authors in this field only people like john drury can do that they can write letters to the editors of journals and newspapers and they <laughs> publish those letters on it so yeah i we can't john drury can't I mean, I, I, one follow up on this is that maybe we should have a more collective effort from the field, like the UMB are in fire field, uh, pedestrian evacuation dynamics field. If we put together a letter with uh, 300 uh, or 400 signatures uh, and we send it to nature, maybe we have hope that it gets published and this stops. But uh, one individual, it's, you know, it's much harder uh, when, when you have a, a collective. <laughs> it's much better. Yeah. I don't know, Anne, any other idea? 
No, I, I think that's exactly right. And I saw so many comments in the chat that are fantastic, including about, you know, critiquing the ideas and peer review. Um, I talk, when I talk to the media, I get asked about panic quite a lot. You know, if something like Asherald happens, get called to explain it, I get asked about panic. And I think it's just been very clear about the issues with using that terminology. But unfortunately, we're up against journalists who are trying to get the articles out there and panic sells, right? That sensationalist approach sells. That's what, what's getting in the headlines. And so I think really a collective effort is a good idea. If we all start saying, well, when you say panic, what do you mean? Is it this? And giving the alternative more nuanced explanations, hopefully are still attractive and sell in the papers, but more accurate. I think it's important we do that, especially if we want to understand, you know, why behavior is actually happening. Thanks, Anne. Thanks for the nice comments. And thanks, Milad, as well. I think we have to wrap up because we're already five minutes over time. So I thank anyone uh, for joining in today. Uh, it's very nice to see that these events are well attended. And we will also post this on our YouTube channel. So I put the link uh, to keep updated on the next events. Uh, me and Erica, we are already having a lot of ideas about the next event. So uh, stay tuned and uh, thank everyone and thank again uh, the speakers. So so bye, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.